Well, hello, everybody. Hopefully, I do not sound like Larry, the DUI chipmunk guy today. Uh, so I am paying attention to the chat in the first 15 seconds to make sure that we are not having any audio issues, first and foremost. So shout out in the chat. Uh, I tried to make sure that my microphone is operational. And I'm just waiting for the chat to give me an indication one way or the other. Dang, no chipmunks. All right. That's what I like to see. That's the, I know that's not what you like to see. That's what I like to see. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry we're late, you guys. I had some technical difficulties uh, this morning and uh, those have been resolved. But without further ado, Let's talk about our guest. Now, Claire Best has been on our channel before. If you all remember, if you have not seen that video, oh my God, go check it out. I uh, The reason she reached out to me in the first place is because I read one of her articles tying uh, Katie Meyer, uh, the girl from Stanford who ended up unliving herself. Uh, because of certain actions by the Title IX committee, by Michelle Dauber and all of those uh, people in her investigative uh, arms that she has created. Uh, I read that article um, on my channel, and it was written by Claire, and then she reached out to me, wanted to talk about it, and she is an absolute goldmine of information. She's an investigative reporter, an investigative journalist, <laughs> And she has done a deep, deep dive into this. And when she reached out and was like, hey, Larry, did you know that FTX, Amber Heard, Michelle Dauber, and Title IX are all connected? And I was like, okay, I knew about uh, Amber Heard, Michelle Dauber, and Title IX. That's kind of obvious. We already kind of talked about it. But did you just say FTX? Are you talking about the biggest the biggest cryptocurrency scandal of like the 20th century. And she was like, yeah, I was like, well, come on down. Let's talk about it. So here she is without further ado. Hi, Claire. Hi, Larry. Happy new year. And thank you for having me back again. <laughs> Happy new year. Thanks for coming back. So, so tell us, okay. It, before, before we take a deep dive into like everything, because I know there's a lot, just can you give us like the surface how on earth is ftx involved in all of this absolutely so uh sam bankman fried who founded ftx is the son of a stanford feminist law professor called barbara fried who works in the same stanford law department as michelle dauber who amber heard credited for the Me Too movement. And uh, in 2017, Barbara Freed, who is, has been a, a very big giver to the Democratic Party, um, and I, I say this because I come off sounding like I'm a Republican, I'm, I'm actually independent, but I'm afraid, unfortunately, this does go into Democratic fundraise, Party fundraising. In any event, uh, so in 2017, Barbara Freed, Sam Bankman Freed's mother, wrote an article that uh, was about why everyone should be feminists. And then shortly after that, Michelle Dauber said publicly or stated publicly in an article that uh, sexual assault was going to be on the ballot for the midterm elections, the 2018 elections. And Michelle Dauber founded this nonprofit called um, enough voter movement which was specifically to target primarily male republicans but i think there were some male democrats as well um to accuse them of sexual assault rightly or wrongly and to use that and the media behind that to basically oust those candidates to get in female democrat candidates and uh they were originally going after somebody in Tennessee, I believe, or um, but uh, I have come across other people who believe that they have been targeted by this strategy 
Uh, one of those is Justin Fairfax in Virginia, who is running for governor or assistant governor. And uh, he actually reached out to me. He and I have been in contact. And, you know, he discovered all of these links back to Michelle Dauber as well. And then I've also been in contact with some of the people who had been supporters of Andrew Cuomo in New York, who got targeted by Me Too. And um, as I say, you know, I don't really know the ins and outs, and I'm neither for nor against Andrew Cuomo, but I did detect that there was kind of an organized strategy of a Me Too to go after him. And, and in fact, one of his accusers who went after him is a woman called Charlotte, um, I think her name is Charlotte Barrett. And she actually had a previous identity as Sally Smith, in which is a you know non nondescript anonymous name, sat in a John Doe versus Hamilton College um, case where John Doe John Doe was a student who was wrongly accused of sexual assault, and she was the false accuser. She is Charlotte Barrett, who was one of the accusers of Andrew Cuomo. So this just shows you kind of how wide ranging this use of these, you know, fake sexual assault narrative against these men have been. And it did become a game. And um, in, I'm not sure if it was, I think it was in 2020, when Alex Morse, who was a 30-ish something uh, Democrat candidate in Massachusetts was running, uh, The Intercept found out that he had been targeted in a Me Too and that senior officials in the Democratic Party had encouraged students to accuse him of sexual assault. So it is a game. And uh, I, as a woman, I find that very upsetting because I think that sexual assault is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, have long been what I call a traditional feminist. And yes, I totally agree. There are aspects of the patriarchy and so forth that are wrong, but I will not stand up and support false accusations um, that ruin people's lives. They ruin their mothers, their sisters, their families, their girlfriends, their children's lives. And, um, and, they're, and worse than that, they're raising money off it and they're getting votes for it. So going back to how does FTX play into all of this and into uh, Stanford Law, Michelle Dauber, um, and there's one other professor there called Pamela Carlin, who um, is another feminist professor. Um, somebody said those aren't feminists, they're extremists. I agree with you. And I think we need to make yeah. a distinction between fem feminism and, and, and extremism, because I think, you know, I, I don't like to use statistics, but I would hazard the guess that I think the vast majority of the population in the world would stand up for feminism, but not for extremism. We call them feminazis. Feminazis, exactly. So um, anyway, uh, so so Michelle Dorber started this Enough Voter movement. And around the same time, uh, Sam Bankman Freed started Alameda Research. So this is, uh, I believe, I'm getting, I might get the dates mixed up a little bit, but I believe it's fall 2017 that he started Alameda Research. And then <clears throat> a little bit later in 2018, his mother, Barbara Freed, uh, the Stanford Law Professor, she started another nonprofit called Mind the Gap with a guy called Paul Brest and another guy called Graham Gottlieb. And they were all out of Stanford. And Graham Gottlieb had been a junior staffer in Obama's 2012 election campaign. And remind me to go back to that because it ties into Amber Heard. So, they started this thing called Mind the Gap out of Stanford that was registered to Sam Bankman Freed's parents' house at, at, on the campus at Stanford and where he is allegedly now. And Mind the Gap was supposed to be a guide to, um, thank you, so happy to see Claire Best, thank you, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so uh, Sam 
Bankman's Freed's parents, or mother rather, let's opened this nonprofit at her house on the campus in Stanford. And the Mind the Gap was a nonprofit that was supposed to guide big donors for the Democratic Party to specific campaigns. So campaigns that they saw that were close across the nation, they would funnel money towards that or to super PACs or whatever. And there's a crazy list of donors on it, which you can find on Influence Watch, which, which there are two sites I want to bring up here for anybody who wants to look further. One is called Influence Watch, and you can look up anybody's name, newspaper, anything. You find out extraordinary information, really fantastic. And the other one, or two other ones, are called Open Corporates, where you can look up people's business filings and whether they're in good standing, who they open them with or not. And the third one is ProPublica, um, where you can look up nonprofits and their tax returns and see who's on the board and who's getting what. And I will say that an awful lot of my research came from these three sites of just digging around. It's public information, but not a lot of people use them. Anyway, moving on. So Mind the Gap then st started up in 2018. And this guy, Graham Gottlieb, who was one of the guys who started it, who came out of Obama's 2012 campaign, he had been a fellow researcher at Stanford and he had been in this department, uh, I think it's the mind, it's like the mind brain science department or something like that. I, I might've got it wrong. And he, and his bio on the Stanford site has actually been taken down now, but there's a little bit of it that is left, which essentially shows that what he was researching was how mind brain science would integrate with federal policies and so forth. So he is registered on Mind the Gap. And then Mind the Gap at the time, and he particularly talked about gaming the system. That's what they said, gaming the system. They were gaming the system to win elections with this Mind the Gap and telling people where to put their money, put it into this race, that race, wherever else. Sorry to interrupt. Does this also uh, bleed into the research done by Cambridge Analytica? Is uh, it may do, but I have not personally come. I mean, let's put it like this. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I don't know that it does because I ha my research hasn't kind of gone into that. Uh, my research has really specifically been more or less around the whole what went wrong with feminism and how it's been used in elections. <laughs> so, Cambridge Analytica was the uh, the company from Great Britain that did a lot of research into realizing the best way to get more voters in your camp is to not go after the diehard rights or the diehard lefts, ignore those, go for the middle. They call them the yellows. And they would find them out and they would target them through like Facebook ad campaigns, I remember by showing not positive ads about the politician they wanted them to vote for, but they found that reinforcing negative emotion about the politician that they wanted to go against was a higher chance that the yellow will swing into the direction you want them to go in. But that's a whole other topic. Please continue. I, I just wanted no, to know. No, no, no. And you're, you're, it, it does all tie into this. And I, I would say I, my guess is that it does. I have found a connection between Stanford and Cambridge, whether it's Stanford and Cambridge Analytica specifically, I don't know. But I think it's highly likely. I mean, this is just such an incredibly deep, dark web. It's scary. Yeah, <laughs> um, literally. Yeah. But uh, but in any event, so 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 then um, so to, so so then uh, Mind the Gap started in 2018. Then Mind the Gap research started in uh, I think it was April 2019, registered to this guy, Graham Gottlieb, at Sam Bankman Freed's parents house on Stamp on Stanford campus. And. Then in a little bit later in 2019, FTX started up. And I think it was fall 2019 that FTX US started up. In fact, there is there is an FTX EU, which nobody's really talked about, and I think is very curious, that started in Cyprus 
uh, in 2014. And um, that, that is registered to Sam Bankman Freed as well, as well as another company in Cyprus that opened in 2016 called Innovatia. Um, and nobody's really talked about those or what they were doing, but that's that's another subject. In any event, so uh, Sam Bankman Freed starts up um, FTX in, in later in 2019. And around that time in November 2019, Obama who I voted for, was a very big fan of, he publicly stated that uh, the Democrats needed to step in and stop Bernie Sanders from winning. And I don't know if that's related or not to what happened next, but I think the timing is very curious because the next thing that happens is in the third week of March 2020, Sam Bankman-Fried opens up FTX offices under the name of West Realm Shires in several states around the United States, which look at first glance like they're strategic, you know, um, strategic, strategic places for winning elections. And three weeks later, on the 8th of April, 2020, Joe Biden is announced as the presumptive nominee. Now, between when Sam Bankman Freed opened these offices around the United States in the third week of March 2020 and that 8th of April 2020, what happens? But Tara Reid accuses Joe Biden of such assault. In fact, specifically of digital penetration and uh, in broad daylight when she was a 23 or 24 year old intern working for her or junior staffer working for him and he was a senate on Capitol Hill. And she was brought broadly kind of dismissed by the entire democratic establishment. The New York Times admitted later that they took three weeks to comment on it that they had revised their articles to make Joe Biden look more favorable. It later came out that SKDK, which is the Democratic Party PR firm, had who also represent L'Oreal, for whom Amber Heard is an ambassador, that they had spent, I think, something like $2 million to discredit Tara Reid. And... Uh, you know, and so, but what, but what was interesting about that is that Michelle Dorber came out onto Twitter and said, begging the Democratic DNC to get Joe Biden to step down, not to run, because they, and in fact, in one tweet, she said, we don't want Watergate too. And I always thought we don't want Watergate too meant that she didn't want the whole fakeness of the whole Me Too movement to unravel. But now I'm looking at it with this whole FTX thing, thinking, wait a minute, not only were you using feminism for and sexual assault for uh, fundraising and votes for the Democratic Party elections, but now a law professor in your same department who is with Mind the Gap, who was supposedly advising her son with FTX as to where they should put their money, is also involved and it becomes a whole crypto scam. Wow. So, and and on top of that, last time we spoke, I mentioned that there was uh, allegedly an FBI investigation going on in Santa Clara County that involved Michelle Dorber called Operation Mystery Dinner. Um, well, on the blog site, Jane and John Q, uh, which has a lot about Michelle Dorber, it's alleged on that that Michelle Dorber was in, and, and the local attorneys and elected officials in Santa Clara County, which is where Stanford is, uh, were involved in their own crypto scam. Whether it's the same one, I don't know, but they were, <laughs> according to this. Wow. Yeah. So it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, and I, so the other element that ties into this, that I purely came across by accident as I was digging around on open corporates, uh, was I looked up Michelle Dorber, and lo and behold, Michelle Dorber started a nonprofit at her home, own home address in Palo Alto, next near Stanford, in 2008 with Davida Brooke. And who is Davida Brooke? 
Well, she was Amber Heard's attorney until dur during the Sun trial, and then until it became evident that the ACLU had created the Washington Post Me Too op-ed. And when it became known that the Washington Post Me Too op-ed had been created for Amber Heard by the ACLU, Amber Heard's legal team quit abruptly without any explanation. And the people who quit included David Brook, Roberta Kaplan, David Brook, and, and a couple of others. And nobody really kind of pursued that thread, but I'm now of the opinion that that Washington Post op-ed literally directly had Michelle Dorber's involvement in it, in creating it. And the reason I say that is because there's a paragraph in it that talks about Title IX and um, you, you know sexual assault on campus. And Michelle Dorber was the co-creator, co-author of the unregulated 2011 Dear Colleague letter that was launched in New Hampshire by Joe Biden and led to all this camp campus kangaroo oh, courts and this disciplinary pro procedure, which ultimately you know, backfired and led to things like Katie Meyer's death. Right, right, right. Um, and the crypto thing goes back to then as well, because the other thing I discovered was that, um, so, uh, in 2009, the Department of Justice started funding the University of New Hampshire, where the Dear Colleague letter was introduced, started funding the uh, University of New Hampshire Prevention Innovation Research Center with $900,000 and then several more million dollars after that for two things. And one was called Know Your Power, which has now been trademarked, but seems to copy the name of a book by Nancy Pelosi that was published in 2008. And uh, bystander, or bringing in the bystander training, which is supposed to prevent sexual assault on campus. And Know Your Power and Bystander Training went on to get more funding from the Department of Justice, were introduced in schools and colleges around the states, around, around the the nation and across the world. And then in 2018, they went under the umbrella of a thing called Soteria Solutions. And Soteria Solutions is based out of the University of New Hampshire. It is a for-profit enterprise. It was recognized by the White House for entrepreneurship using federal funds. And it coincidentally shares the exact same logo as Soteria Finance Holdings in London. Different color, Soteria Solutions is like a turquoise green color. And they're not very original, are they? And Soteria Finance Holdings in London is orange, but the logo the exact, is the exact same. So I looked up on open corporate Soteria Finance Holdings and I looked into its corporate papers and Soteria Finance Holdings deals in Binance and Bitcoin. And it is owned by another company in Luxembourg that is owned by somebody called Stephen Schwartzman in New York, who is BlackRock. And Sam Bankman-Fried has been tied to BlackRock. So I would like to know if our public oh funds God. have gone to the University of New Hampshire via the Department of Justice to fund a very faulty, very... Um, gender biased investigative uh, procedure that's being sold around the country around the world under soteria and if in fact it is a for-profit enterprise that ends up in bitcoin and binance and if it's tied to ftx as i say i can't say that it is i just find it very curious that soteria is an unusual name anyway and now in London, in UK, they've introduced Operation Soteria, which is supposed to increase the successful prosecutions of sex offences. And it's like, I'm not interested in increasing or decreasing the prosecution of sex offences. What I'd like to see is a fair and just process 
a due process where everybody is treated equally, where the facts speak for themselves, where they're not manipulated with the help of media, social media, algorithms, whether somebody's got the money or not, and that everybody gets a fair play. But what we're seeing um, is that, you know, justice more than ever is, is not fair and justice more than ever is being manipulated by the use of social media, by pay partnerships, by, um, you know, Twitter, and it has a center at Stanford where it's all altered. And, um, you know, this f disgusting fusion between the Department of Justice and our education systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a third feminist professor at Stanford Law that I want to mention in all of this, and her name is Pamela Carlin, K-R-A-L-A-N, who describes herself somewhere as a uh, whiny Jewish lesbian, <laughs> or words similar. She came out of the Obama Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights, and she is um, at Stanford Law School, and she's a feminist professor. And she recently, uh, she took a leave of absence from Stanford, they announced it, to go and work in the Department of Justice again, until a few months ago when the New York Post announced that she'd quietly stepped down from the New York, from the um, US Department of Justice because a uh, financial disclosures showed that the Department of Justice was paying Stanford for her Department of Justice salary while she was, which was $180,000 or something like that, while she was simultaneously getting well over a million, I think it might have been as much as 1.9 million from Stanford. So the Department of Justice were paying Stanford for her to be, be at the, um, you know, be at the Department of Justice, and she was sitting as a feminist professor coming out of the Office of Civil Rights at Stanford. And I looked wow. up, and I looked up her bio, Michelle Dauber's bio, and Barbara Freed's bio, and their lectures that they give their courses on the Stanford Law School site. And it is quite shocking because some of them are literally just meetings and they're about feminism and the elections and so on and so forth. So it's it's a real pickle uh, that is quite disgusting and I think deserves um, a lot more scrutiny from the public. Uh, and, you know, Stanford, I think, is burying its head in the sand. Stanford right now is facing all sorts of ethical complaints. Um, one of their, they, the Stanford Daily even admitted that they made a false statement about one of their professors who's just had to cough up or been told to cough up 29 million for, um, a, 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 for science, scientific um, di discoveries that were false. And their head, Mark Tessier Levine, who comes out of Pfizer, he's being investigated right now because apparently he possibly um, fudged falsified images that he was using in a scientific research paper that has been quoted around the world. Um, the Stanford is facing a official Title IX complaint for sex discrimination, gender bias. And, uh, and then just yesterday or the day before, um, Stanford's Title IX department was issued a formal request for an investigation into Michelle Dorper specifically um, and actually quoting some of the things that she had done regarding Amber Heard and uh, you using social media, um, her criticisms of Camille Vasquez and, uh, you know, generally a, a, an ethics complaint against her. So that's what's going on. It's a big subject. And um, I think that it's an, I think it's a subject that everybody should be paying attention to. It is our money. Our money has been misused and abused. And, um, and I wanted to, oh, I wanted to circle back to um, Graham Gottlieb and the Obama mm -hmm. 2012 election, because mm -hmm. 
the uh, thank you very much for it's insane all this going on behind the scenes bravo thank you very much i really appreciate it and as i say i never intended to go down this rabbit hole it's not my primary job my primary job is a film and television agent but you know i was dealing with gender discrimination in my industry protecting my clients who'd either been falsely accused or who had been sexually assaulted and um I, I, it was just one of those things where I thought I have to find out what's going on. It, I, this is just, this is, this is affecting all of us. It's very, very serious. It's karma, baby. Yeah. Um, exactly. Exactly. Karma, baby. <laughs> and, you know, if you think about it, like all of these, uh, you know, I'm so, I have to say, I'm so glad I voted independent in the last election. I, it was the best thing I ever did. I mean, e even if it didn't have an effect, you know, use your vote, vote, really vote for ethics. Um, because in the end, you know, it, you, you can't just say vote blue no matter who or vote red or whatever. It, it, it's not the the whole 99% thing. It is the rest of us voters. And, you know, you find out that basically we're being manipulated so much by FTX, by these donations, by Mind the Gap, by Michelle Dorber, by the Enough Voter Movement, by their partnerships with political PR companies. So in line with political PR companies, um, Amber Heard had a political PR company called Precision Strategies until the end of the first week of the Virginia trial when they split company. And... Uh, I looked into Precision Strategies. Precision Strategies was founded by a woman called Stephanie Cutter, who coincidentally was Obama's PR strategist for the 2012 election campaign, like Graham Gottlieb, who founded Mind, Mind the Gap. And Precision Strategies also happens to represent the ACLU and Planned Parenthood. And Stephanie Cutter, in her bio, talks specifically about her relations with the Washington Post, with Rolling Stone, with Politico magazine, and, you know, and a few others, but those three particularly, which, you know, are all ones that have essentially been very much aligned with the Amber Heard narrative. So, uh, you know, I had long maintained that Amber Heard was a, uh, you know, an asset, if you like, a political um, tool for the Democratic Party. Um, she used to be president of and CEO of Under the Black Sky. Did you know that? Who's that? Stephanie Cutter? Amber Heard. She was? I don't know what Under the Black Sky is. Oh, I thought that's the one of the companies you mentioned that was kind of the um, uh, the umbrella branches of FTX, but I could be wrong. Oh, I no, Alameda. Alameda is... A, is okay. Yeah, Al, 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 the, 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 I mean, there are several companies involved with FTX, but Alameda Research and FTX are the two main ones. Okay, sorry, yeah. please continue. Um, but, uh, you know, Amber Heard has been a spokesperson, I believe, for UN Women as well, who, who as well as L'Oreal, are also represented by SKDK. And SKDK is a political PR company that also represents Pfizer. It represents the government of Ukraine. It represents Prince Albert of Monaco. It represents um, AT&T. It represents Disney, which owns ABC. Uh, it represents um, uh, a, a nonprofit called It's On Us, which is about campus rape. It did represent Time's Up and the National Women's Legal Center until it came out that they had worked um against the accusations of uh, against Andrew Cuomo, and they admitted that there was a conflict of interest. Um, and they represent a nonprofit called Vital Voices, which was founded by Madeleine Albright and Hillary Clinton in 1997 with money from the Clinton Foundation. And the Clinton Foundation was uh, founded in part by Jeffrey Epstein. So, and Jeffrey Epstein's survivors have actually been pushing for discovery on the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Global Foundation, uh, for how their money has spent. And then, as some people may have 
seen in the last few days the Attorney General of the British, sorry, the US Virgin Islands um, sued the bank JP Morgan, uh, accusing JP Morgan of essentially being complicit in Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sac- sex trafficking. And four days after, four days after she filed this suit, she got fired by the governor of the US Virgin Islands. And who happened to be in the US Virgin Islands at this time? Joe Biden and apparently Bill Gates. And Bill Gates had called Jeffrey Epstein his financial guru. So as I say, who really knows what's at the bottom of all of this? But it's dark and it's dirty and things keep, you know, things keep getting taken off the table, taken out of public view. And I think it's really disturbing. And you, you, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take a rocket science to, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at open corporates, which by the way, I suggest everybody does. Go to open, go to open corporates, look up Sam Bankman-Fried, look at the number of companies that he is involved in. It is staggering. And you think that Sam Bankman-Fried was had four meetings with the White House. He had, had his company was given a trading and brokering account, uh, you know, pass or license. And he was meeting with Gary Gensler at the SEC. He he and his father, who's a tax professor, tax attorney professor at Stanford. Uh, we're you know we're talking to um, members. I only of see one. Sorry, I only see one company where he's what, an officer. Bankman Freed? Click. Sam ba- yeah. Uh, look, there's 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 tons of them. Look on, just go on to unless they've taken them all down. But uh, I can't read the writing big enough. But click on the bold. Click. Oh, oh, there we go. Yeah, click on that bold. Yeah, there you go. Now there should be a whole ton of. I wonder if they've changed, taken it down. Yesterday, there were tons. West Realm Shires. Look up West. Go to where you were. Where, yeah, look, go on to West Realm Shires. There sh- and you see down the right, right side. Mm. There's like a hundred and at the top, there's a little flag post-it uh, that says something like 107. Yeah, they push on, press on that. Yeah, there you go. Press on that and you're going to cut. There you go. There we go. I see. These are all the companies that are interrelated. But the reason that I find that very curious is I'm a lay person. I'm not a finance person. And I don't have a degree in economics. <laughs> um, I can look at that and I can look at the dates of all of those opening. And I can look at the funding that went into the election campaigns and say, isn't there something fishy here? So why is it? that Gary Gensler at the SEC, that the White House, that Steve Ricchetti, who, who um, you know, is, is Biden's, I think, campaign finance guy, that they can just take, you know, $5 million here, a few million dollars here, 20, and they don't, not one of them looks into this and say, hang on a minute, isn't this a little weird that this guy opened all these companies, you know, around the same time? Like, where's the money coming from? And nobody's really answered. I mean, the Alameda, which is what he started originally, they did talk about, you know, investors in that money in into that fund, but it's an awful lot of money, and you know the and FTX was officially partnered with Ukraine, which, if you remember, has SKDK as its PR company, and it was officially partnered with the World Economic Forum. And both the World Economic Forum and Ukraine have tried to distance themselves from being involved with FTX. But you have to ask, how is it that this upstart with parents at Stanford Law School and, you know, with Stanford's involvement with Google, with Twitter, with Pfizer and and, and with the Democratic Party fundraising, how did it get this far? And you can guarantee in fact you can even see it in the new york times articles that they're they're trying to kind of downplay it and they're feeling sorry for his parents and so forth and 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 i'm sorry i i 
I don't feel sorry for his parents. You don't buy a $16 million house in the Bahamas if you're a tax attorney and and a, and a law professor and claim that actually it was, you know, even though it says it's a holiday home on the listing, that it was meant to be part of the company. I think that they're all covering this up. And I, and I feel really egregious by this because you have these students around the country at, at Stanford, at, you know, everywhere who have nothing like the privileges of these people who are basically preaching to the rest of us their, you know, woke ideology for, you know, effective altruism, earning a lot of money and giving it all away. And it's like you look into it and what are they doing? They're giving it to their friends. They're pretending that they care about diversity, equity, inclusion, feminism, blah, blah, blah. It's all rubbish. It's all a, it's all a front. And, and I find it really upsetting and, and um, dismissive of the public and the public's interests and our children. And so why am I here fighting all of this? Because I feel like it's our children's futures. And... You know, we if we're not going to leave our children with a more ethical, better, better world, what are we doing? Right. No, <clears throat> I, I couldn't have said it better. Um, did you see the latest um, New York trying to, and I think they actually passed, the statute uh, that is now putting a cap, a one-year cap statute of limitations on sexual offenses? I did, and I not did it just end or did it just start? Because California had the same, I think. I believe they just passed it, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm okay with that. My, I'm definitely okay with that. My problem is we need to take the politics and ambulance chasing out of it all. Yes, and we need Couldn't to agree take. More. You know, you know, Tom Girardi, who is, you know, a prominent attorney and, uh, you know, prominent fundraiser for or contributor to the Democratic Party. You know, he's just been found guilty of, you know, spending clients money on all sorts of stuff. And it's like, you know, on the and yet he gets a special <laughs> bless you. He thank gets you. he get he gets a special thank you on the hunting ground documentary which also was financed out by democratic donors out of stanford and uh i you know or gloria allred another one you know i mean uh, she's an ambulance chaser allegedly she's being invested by investigated by the fbi as well and it's like if somebody said yesterday what's the difference between an activist and a propagandist and my answer to that is an activist is someone who will answer, is passionate about what they believe in, but will answer questions with reasoning behind what they believe. A propagandist is someone who sings the song, but who can't answer questions rationally and then just shuts you down. Michelle Dauber is a propagandist. Mm -hmm. She doesn't answer questions. She runs away. Um, she spouts all sorts of, you know, venomous, hateful things on the internet. She's racist. Um, and I think she's a misogynist as well as a misandrist. And, uh, you know, I, I think we, I, I think we have to really take people like that on head on and call them out. And it's, you know, Michelle Dauber, you know, is 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 a kingpin but there are other kingpins and or, or queenpins <laughs> there there are other uh you know people out there and they're surrounded by this network of these activist journalists like cat tenenbarge like um taylor lorenz uh like susan zalkind um that you know i mean you 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 can literally pull them out and there's a whole list of these you know act so-called active activist feminist journalists they're not activist feminist journalists at all they're propagandist feminist journalists and they're tied into this network with these political pr companies coming up with these narratives for amber heard and so forth and as i say I, you know i'm no fan of amber heard and i think but but as i said last time we need to separate out what happened 
with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp in their marriage versus how she became a political tool afterwards. And the ACLU said in 2016, in summer 2016, in fact, that she had given her three and a half million of the seven million divorce settlement to the ACLU. The ACLU stated that. They knew that she hadn't. So the ACLU lied. The head of the ACLU, Anthony D. Romero, also comes out of Stanford Law School. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so they lied. Then she appears in November 2016 with Michelle Dorber to get the Women of the Year Award that is given to Michelle Dorber, um, who's collecting it for Emily Doe, a.k.a. Chanel Miller, for after the Emily Doe victim impact statement, which it appears that Michelle Dorber wrote herself. And then in the trial of the um, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard in Virginia, the ACLU said at one point, or the representative of the ACLU said at one point, that um, the said at one point that uh, they had got Amber Heard because they'd heard her speak so eloquently about women's issues and for UN women and things like that. And I'm thinking like, yeah, she doesn't write that stuff. It's created for her. She's she's an actor. She's speaking yeah. it. And yeah, is this she really how to deliver? Yeah, and is this really Michelle Dorber behind it all? And I I believe that due process, if we were ever allowed to have it, would reveal that Michelle Dorber is behind a ton of this. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, there was one very interesting thing that we collectively have uncovered yesterday because I I didn't even really fully think about it. I'm sure it would have clicked eventually. But chat uh, helped me put the pieces together. So now that the uh, trial is over with, between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, now that the appeal has been settled, um, the and it's also over, we are now taking a deep dive into the remaining litigation between Amber Heard and her insurance companies, uh, namely Travelers and uh, New York Marine. So... It appears, um, well, without getting into too much detail, I don't want to waste your time, but the, here's the primary culprit, the primary factor that Chad pointed out yesterday that really is starting to raise some eyebrows. Uh, the policy that Amber Heard took out with New York Marine for a million dollars per incident, um, which includes defamation, uh, unlike page, it's like 57. So it's a huge policy, a very, very comprehensive policy. And it's a policy that normally people don't take out unless, uh, well, maybe actors. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe actors have like some certain specific policies that they take out that normal humans might not. But this is what we found. So the article, the op-ed that she, that was published, right? So the op-ed was published in uh, mid-December of 2018. Uh, well, she takes out this policy with New York Marine in July of 2018, five months prior, and the magnitude and the, the well, the, the, just the sheer magnitude of this op-ed, I would not put it past the fact that it probably took about six months to draft from like beginning to end, from when the idea was first sparked to publication. You know, an article of that magnitude is easily could have taken six months to draft. And Chad had a very interesting theory, and I wanted to run this to see what you might think about it. Uh, because, you know, insurance fraud is a very, very delicate, sensitive subject. Sometimes it's easy to prove. I gave the example of uh, the individual who took out like five fire insurance policies and then his home magically burned down five days later. Uh, you know, that was kind of a clear intentional act, etc. But in this case, it's a little bit more veiled. It's a little bit more hidden. We don't have maybe all the fingers immediately pointing, but I don't know, maybe with some additional discovery, something could arise. And New York Marine is not arguing any of this in their complaint uh, or their um, 
responses thus far. Now, that may change. I don't know. But I'm wondering if there is potentially a cause of action for uh, defrauding or attempting to defraud an insurance company now that more facts are coming to light and I'm covering the case more extensively, that is it possible that Amber Heard like predicted that there is a possibility that I will be sued and in order to protect herself uh, uh, took out the policy with New York Marine and Travelers well, we definitely know New York Marine. I don't exactly know when Travelers was instituted, but they're the only ones who are still paying money out uh, for Amber. I believe Travelers Insurance is, uh, and and one of Travelers agents was in the courtroom. By the way, I saw her. The Pamela something uh, was in the courtroom in in Fairfax almost on the daily. So now the question becomes: uh, d When she made her disclosures, because when you uh, ask for an insurance company to cover you. You have to fill out tons and tons of forms, especially with a policy like this. I, I can only imagine how many forms she had to fill out. And usually, uh, since I'm covered under malpractice insurance, you know, I have car insurance and all that stuff. So I'm familiar with it. I have per firsthand experience. One of the things that they usually ask you is, do you anticipate of like being sued in the next 12 months? Because an insurance company does not want to cover you if you're like, oh, hell yeah, I'm, I, I did so much garbage. I'm getting ready to be sued out the wazoo from every corner. You know, that's something the insurance company needs to know. Or if you're preparing and drafting something that could potentially land you in, in hot water, uh, the insurance company needs to know these things. And I'm wondering if in the application process, obviously, it doesn't seem logical that Amber would disclose like, oh, yeah, I'm about to create potentially the most defamatory statement of the 21st century, right, against uh, an actor who doesn't deserve it, then New York Marine would have been like, take a hike. We're not insuring you. You're too much of a liability. You're too much of a risk. It's pretty much a guarantee that we're going to have to pay. Your premiums are not going to offset the payments for the, the policy. Therefore, goodbye, take a hike. Mm -hmm. So we're now starting to wonder if there is a potential um, insurance fraud claim that could surface in the near future that's kind of been on our radar since we started doing it yesterday i don't know I if think, you have any thoughts on that. yeah I, I do have some thoughts on that and i think it's very interesting and actually i'm really glad you raised it about the insurance thing because i run a company and one of the things that i see with these claims and the whole gloria all right claims and things is you know our insurance premiums go up because we start you know we we have to protect ourselves now against you know these you know, false claims and so forth. And so, uh, you know, as as a as a female business owner, I'm really angry about it because every person that comes yeah. along, like Amber Heard, or you know, uh, these the you know some Gloria Allred's you know false accusers, drives up our insurance premiums, and it is insurance fraud. And I think that the and I'm surprised that the American Bar Association hasn't really cracked down on uh these ambulance chasing attorneys and really hey warm. i take offense to that i'm an ambulance chasing <laughs> attorney well going I'm a self admitted though i'm a self-admitted though no well go, going after someone for money for the right reasons is is the right thing but here you have you know the people behind amber heard roberta kaplan you know david abrook you know the the glory all reds of the world and so forth who have basically taken sexual assault turned it into a political thing used an actor or or or, or you know a, a recruited person to push this narrative and then tried to kind of shirk behind in the shadows and i i guarantee you i don't think I, I just don't think that Amber Heard is smart enough to have decided to take out that kind of insurance um, claim by herself. I mean, let's say, I'm not saying she's not smart or smart, but I just don't, you know, I don't think it's something that I would have done necessarily. So why was she doing it? Now, there are very good reasons why she would do it. And that is in 2018, starting earlier in the year, Amber Heard became very politically active for the Me Too movement. She was the VIP guest at Vital Voices. She 
went to the Women's March um, thing. She spoke for UN Women. She uh, you she was a, and then in the whole correspondence leading up to the publication of the Washington Post op-ed, there was a discussion in the emails about the risks of her being um, uh, being sued for defamation. And uh, and if you recall, at one point the ACLU wanted to enter uh, into the lawsuit that Johnny Depp had against her with her, which is peculiar. So the ACLU, frankly, I think should be put up there on every media channel and questioned about exactly what was going on. And Anthony D. Romero tried to avoid deposition and he didn't want to um, he didn't want to reveal ACLU's business relationships with their other things. Well, I can tell you that all those um, nonprofits and victims' rights advocacy groups that signed that amicus brief a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, that Michelle Dauber's signature on, they're all one, they're all one and the same. They're all one and the same. And I think that it is absolutely preposterous that the IRS and the Department of Justice hasn't cracked down on them all and sued them all uh, 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 and, you know, demanded fines and demanded accountability and prosecutions for what's been going on because they're, they're all tied up together. They, the, many of those nonprofits that signed that amicus brief also signed another amicus brief in the, to the Connecticut Supreme Court in a case called Sayafula Khan, K-H-A-N versus Yale University, um, oh. because Saifula Khan was wrongly accused of sexual assault. It went to a criminal trial. He was acquitted on everything. He turned around, he sued Yale for 110 million and he sued the false accuser and he maintained that the false accuser had been set up to do it, just like Amber Heard. Oh my God. And these and these and these nonprofits stepped in and wrote an amicus brief basically in support Ooh. of this girl and saying essentially that false accusations should be fine and that it would be set a horrible precedent if they weren't. And so thank God the Connecticut Supreme Court rejected their amicus brief first time round because in their amicus brief they said Sayafula Khan raped Jane Doe, the girl. And the, since he'd been acquitted of rape, oh. but the, the, the Connecticut Supreme Court rejected it and said they, had, they could resubmit their amicus brief shorn of all facts that hadn't been proven as material fact, i.e. they had to yeah. remove the fact that he, they couldn't say, you know, Saifula Khan raped Jane Doe. So they did resubmit and the oral arguments have been heard and I don't think a decision has been made yet. But it was, um, there's a, there's a, a professor uh, in Brooklyn called Casey Johnson, who's been magnificent at following these false accusations and Title IX cases in college campuses. And Casey Johnson commented that in the oral arguments, uh, or maybe the written arguments in, in this case, that uh, it was really peculiar that Yale seemed to kind of not distinguish itself from this girl and side it up together. So in other words, instead of it being the false accuser, Yale in the middle, and you know the Connecticut court system and Sy and Sy Fuller Khan, either four parties, that in their arguments, it appeared that Yale and the false accuser were aligned together. So you, here you have Yale supporting a false accuser. Here you have Stanford supporting false accusers. You have, it, it's, 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 it's dangerous. And yeah. they're the same, and they're the same nonprofits, the National Women's Legal Center, Know Your Nine, it's on us. It's the same ones who were supporting Amber Heard's, you know, and her amicus brief. And I think that every single one of these should be scrutinized. And 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 they're all us, they're also all 
also all earning gob loads of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look you look on ProPublica and you look at their IRS Form 990 returns and you see the line items, they're earning a lot of money. You know, the ACLU guy, I think he's earning over a million dollars now. And then the next person below him does like 12 hours a week and, you know, gets 300 and something thousand dollars. I mean, so, oh so you can't sit here and tell me that the ACLU cares about rights or that they care about diversity, equity, inclusion when they're all cleaning up like kings. Mm -hmm. The their nonprofits aren't paying taxes because they're nonprofits. And, you know, unlike the rest of us in our companies who are paying our taxes, paying, paying our corporate taxes, it's it, it, it's 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 it is it is it is absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Hey, Divinity. Hi. Uh, you you came you came at the <laughs> at the right time. We are dropping truth bombs here. There is so much clip material in this video, and I'm not just saying that. Ask the chat. I mean, oh my God, I'm gonna have to rewatch this video to to catch up because it's 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 so much to digest. Claire, you are like you are like Alexandria, <laughs> you know. You you get the joke. I'll, I'll explain to the chat. Alexandria is the oldest library uh, in the world. It, unfortunately, part of it has burned down uh, a few hundred years ago. And so we lost, I don't know how much knowledge and information written down by our predecessors, but that's what Claire is. She's absolutely just loaded with information and connecting the dots of how many questions have we had about all this stuff. And Claire, it just it like we it's watching you talk, Claire. It's like you're weaving this, this net of, of, completely with, with seemingly unconnected things that through your research and you're, you're absolutely phenomenal absolutely um, phenomenal thank you um, thank you thank you thank you thank you everybody i mean i i truly um oh, do i have a i have a medium account it's claire best on medium um and i have written about some of this on there and i've also written um on another site called empower the Inno innocent um or empowering the innocent uh so you can you can find me there and as i say i i i do keep this kind of separate from my my from my main business but it is a public interest thing and i find myself in a unique position to talk about this because i'm female i'm a female business owner i went to an all boys school um you know i've witnessed you know and experienced sexual harassment etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I have daughters and, you know, and I'm not owned by a corporation, but I work with all the big corporations. And so I, you know, my feeling is that anybody who is in a position to be able to speak up must speak up because most people can't. They can't because they're part of a corporate corporation and there are things that stop them from speaking up or they are facing wrongful accusations um, their children are. Uh, I can't tell you how many families I have come across who have sons or daughters who are um, facing, you know, harassment, accusations, charges, who've been cancelled, who've had to drop out of school, drop out of college because they supported someone. Um, and I just think it's really wrong. And it, it's, a, it's a very dangerous atmosphere that we have um that that has been allowed to be created and our our children have been manipulated i mean i you know when i grew up we didn't have internet we didn't have cell phones we didn't have you know we had we had encyclopedias and so forth and these days you know kids grow up and you know they watch tiktok or facebook or or youtube and you know they don't realize that what they're watching is manipulating them that, you know, they're being told that Amber Heard is a survivor next to a lipstick ad that they want in Teen Vogue or Glamour magazine. And so they're looking at the lipstick ad and that read, takes them to read what Amber Heard has to say. And she's beautiful and she's a role model. And so therefore they can be a survivor 
like Amber Heard or a vegan or an atheist or whatever it is. And it's like, I mean, that's what she said in her Glamour magazine article. And it's like, I'm fine if somebody's a survivor, vegan or atheist. But you know what? I'd like to know if I'm being sold that as a lobbyist, which is what she was. And I think that we need to have very clear lobby guidelines so that the reader knows that the article that they're reading is a piece of lobbying. Oh my God. So being a survivor is like the hottest trend and it's chic. So if you haven't been assaulted sexually, just make it up and then you'll join the club. Yeah. Holy fuck. Well, if you go, so here, here, this will be mind blowing. I went on the what? R. I went on the RAINN network yesterday. That's the Rape and Incest National Network, I think it's called, which is the largest lobby group for sexual assault and survivors. Mm -hmm. And it is commonly quoted in mainstream media and by workplaces and colleges and universities as being the kind of definitive resource. But I encourage everybody to look at the fine print on there and you will find that it has a disclaimer at the bottom, which basically says that the Department of Justice and so forth doesn't endorse a single thing on it. Not a single thing, nothing. But then you go into other areas of it. And one of the first things you come to is how to interview a survivor. Does this story work for you? And it's essentially encouraging people to it's encouraging survivor status and it's encouraging journalists to go and find survivor stories and to tell these stories. And it's like, it's not that I'm not interested in survivor stories. I'm interested in this, in the truth and every false survivor story there is harms someone with a real survivor story. Yes. And I think that's a very serious issue. We are harming feminism with what we're doing. We are yeah. harming women's credibility. We, 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 I personally, my mother, my grandmother, you know, fought for years, for centuries to get a place at the table. We found a place at the table by being honest, by being truthful, by owning what we did wrong. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, I'm just not going to buy into, and I don't, want my daughters to and I don't want anyone to buy into this you know believe all women da, empowering da 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 it's like you know is that I I hated her at the time but is that what Maggie Thatcher did is that what Mrs Gandhi did is that what you know Angela Merkel did um is that what Condoleezza Rice did is that you know we've we've had really fantastic you, you know female leaders i mean including hillary clinton that nobody nobody did any of this until the last decade and then they turned it into this thing and frankly they've really harmed us yeah they really did well claire um Thank you for coming back on the show. You have been absolutely phenomenal. I think my, my brain kind of melted, as I'm sure the rest of the chat did. We're we're gonna have to go back and, and rewatch this, you guys, because that's there it's just too much. It, it for even for me, and I'm used to being overloaded with information. So that that tells you something. So if you're lost, don't feel bad. Uh you're you're in good company. Um we uh, hopefully, Claire, as you continue on your research, I mean, this is the second time you've appeared on our show. Uh, I hope we can have you back in a few weeks when you have more updates and new connections. And and um, again, thank you for coming on. This has been absolutely incredible. Thank, thank you. Um, just one last little thing to add in here before I sign off. Please. So you were talking about what the the false insurance claim potentially. Yes. And, um, one thing that I noticed is that when I looked into this nonprofit called Building a Better Legal Profession that Michelle Dorber founded with David Brook, who was Amber Heard's attorney. How fucking ironic. Sorry. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I should be the one starting something like that with that. I name. know. <laughs> Building a better, how about how to use a social media platform to 
to uh, be the most vile individual on the planet, LLC. That should be Dauber's company. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not kidding. She founded it in March 2008 with David Brook, who became Amber Heard's attorney. But what was interesting is the open corporate site looks like the company dissolved in June 2015, which was around the time that Michelle Dauber and her husband, Ken Dauber, were being probed for a too close relationship with the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. But then on December the 1st, 2018, there's an entry with Michelle Dauber coming in again. And so I want to know if that has anything to do with the lead up to the December 18th, 2018 Washington Post op-ed. I think it's very curious. And the same thing with your insurance um, you claim. I think that I think the timing and the orchestration of this is all very strange. The she glamour yeah yeah well and the glamour magazine article came out i think it came out in the fall of 2018 when amber heard you know said that she's nobody i'm nobody's victim amber heard and then she credits michelle dauber in the article for the me too movement and she says she says that she is just amplifying michelle dauber's voice um i almost missed this Uncle Brett, thank you for the generous donation. Thanks. I believe you also just joined on as a member. So thank you for that as well. Don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, join on as a member if you're so inclined. Uh, Viking Wolf by Blood has so graciously uh, donated 20 members yesterday. And I can't, unfortunately, when I'm in StreamYard, I can't see them. So I just remembered and uh, I wanted to, I don't, I don't think she's in the chat, but I wanted to thank her. Uh, next time you all see her, let her know that I thanked her. And I will thank her again if I if I don't forget. Uh, but anyway, um, Uncle Brat says, they never seem to demonstrate accountability or experience repercussions. And I think you're talking about all these people involved under the Title IX um, uh, scheme and everything. And, and you're absolutely right. And thank you again for the, the very, very generous um, donation uh welcome uh, annette kamano i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly to the channel as a new member welcome 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 and uh just another rando i love that name says it sounds like johnny depp is the one who spoke truth to power ah is very connected um yes. A, ain't that a surprise, huh? I mean, I don't think any of us are sitting here going like, oh, my God, I I can't believe it. You know, I, there's no way. It's more of a like, tell me more. What else is, you know, buried under this heap of garbage and dirt uh, about all this stuff? So uh, we're definitely, definitely going to um, do this again, Claire. Uh, I absolutely, once again, wanted to thank you for coming on the show for a second time. My audience, you, you saw the comments. I tried to highlight as many of them as I could. They're absolutely in love with you and the information that you're bringing to the table, the research that you've done. This, this, is, this is what independent investigative journalism is all about. And you are an expert, if I may say so myself. Well, th thank thank you so much, um, Larry and, and Trudy. Thank you for what you do. Um, and thank you to all the audience who participate in this because our mainstream media um, really has been shanghaied by these lobbyists and they're all given talking points and we don't get to the truth. And we, you know, we have to get back to inquiry to find the truth. And as I say, you know, I'm open to debate anything here that I've said, anything that is wrong. I'm always open to inquiry. But if we don't ask the questions, we're not going to find the truth. We cannot sit here and be indoctrinated. I agree. That's the best way to end it. Thank you so much for coming on, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, wow. Whew. Um, that's going to take a while to digest. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. FTX, Sam Bankman's, Sam Bankman's Freed's parents 
Michelle Dauber, Amber Heard, Title IX are all in the same boat. They're in the same bed, sleeping together, no pun intended. Um, we also have this Connecticut case. Uh, Mr. Khan, who was accused of sexual assault by a Jane Doe, acquitted, and then sues Yale for $110 million. Another Am another Amber Heard poster girl, basically. Uh, that's just insane. Absolutely insane. Um, whew. I, I mean, I was ready for truth bombs today. I know Claire always brings the best information, the best stuff. But holy mother of God. Ewa Robinson, welcome to the channel. Thank you, Bobby Cat, for the super sticker. Um, yeah, and, and there's just so much more. And of course, uh, if you haven't seen the video I put out yesterday about uh, Amber having to fight her own insurance that is refusing to pay because they're saying her conduct was willful not negligent and insurance policies don't cover willful torts. Intentional torts are not covered by insurance policies such as that of New York Marine. Um, she not, she countersued them and I did a video on that yesterday. So go check it out if you haven't already. Um, we are gonna continue that saga tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to continue that saga. There is the lawsuit by Travelers, which is her other insurance company. Do y'all remember? Do y'all remember the, um, the computer screen of Pamela, what's her name, from Travelers? Uh, because she was seated in the courtroom. She was the blonde lady in the front row on Amber's side, and I was seated two rows behind her. So I, uh, I caught a glimpse of her computer. That's why we were moved one row back when I was in Fairfax, if you all remember that. And some, some YouTubers accused me of taking a photo, and I kept saying, like, if I so much as, you know, if I so much as flashed my phone like this, I would have been booted out of there so fucking fast. Um, that, that, never, that never happened. Uh, the only... The only uh, cameras that captured it were these two, these two magical eyeballs. And I have a brain and I had a notepad and I have eyeballs and that's all you need to be able to disseminate information sometimes. Um, and there was the, the, um, there was the $25,000 bill that travelers paid Gordon Reese. Uh, and if you remember, we still don't really know how Gordon Reese is tied in the defense of Amber Heard. Some people said they they um, they represented her in the UK trial, and they have offices all over the country. I actually met a Gordon Reese employee. She was a uh, um, not a managing partner, but she was definitely up there. Like she had like six or seven attorneys under her in the Louisville branch. Uh, Angela, something or other. I met her at the Kentucky bar association's annual convention back in june so very shortly after the trial literally like two weeks after the verdict um two and a half weeks after the verdict so that was interesting uh definitely an interesting character she invited me to lunch we just never never got a chance to get a, that off the ground i definitely want to uh uh partake <laughs> uh but I asked her about their firm's involvement because I was like, oh, Gordon Reese, because I recognized it immediately. It's like, Gordon Reese, so you work for the company that represented Amber Heard. She's like, I don't know anything about that. And I'm like, I'll, 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 I'll believe you because they, there's like, they probably have like 1,500 attorneys and they all are doing different things. So for her not to know something like that is possible, not likely, but possible. Um, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. She seems cool. I, I don't have anything, uh, anything bad to say about her. So, um, yeah. Um, and I, I remember by the way, with respect to the, the, 
the information that I disseminated real quick. I just want to talk about that for a brief second. Um, a lot of people gave me flack. I remember like, Larry, you are a professional licensed attorney. Like, what are you doing? And da, 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 da. You do realize that it's, it's a little difficult for certain individuals maybe to understand this, but I will explain it to you uh, so that you, at least you understand it. As a human, right, as a human being, because I'm a licensed attorney, because I am, I'm also, a, you know, a civilian, uh, I'm a licensed attorney, civilian, and, you know, to an extent, an investigative journalist, to an extent. I mean, I obviously don't, don't go on, on these very, very deep dives like Claire Best, but I, I do. I do my own brand of journalism, and I report back what I hear, you know, and I use my YouTube channel and my Twitter accounts as a medium to report what I see. So I kind of wear three hats. Sometimes I'm wearing all three hats at the same time, which is extremely rare. Sometimes I'm just wearing my lawyer hat. Like for instance, when I call a client to give them legal advice about a case they have in Kentucky, because I can do that because I'm licensed to practice law there. I put on my lawyer hat, right? My, my citizen hat, my civilian hat, and my investigative journalist hat are seated, metaphorically speaking, of course, like on the table, right? They're not on my head. And then when I'm done talking to the client, I can take it off, fire up the YouTube channel. And now I'm, I'm like my fourth hat, my YouTube streamer hat, if you want to call it that. I, would, I wouldn't really, that's more of my, I would call it my civilian hat, you know. And it, sometimes you will literally be switching hats mid-conversation. You never know, like somebody asks, oh, by the way, I have a question about like license suspension. Oh, boom, my lawyer hat comes on, I give the answer, and boom, my lawyer hat comes off. When I was in Virginia, in Fairfax, I did not have my lawyer hat on probably for a single second, for the most part. Why? Because I wasn't there in the capacity of an attorney. See, attorneys have something known as a fiduciary duty. What is a fiduciary duty? Fiduciary simply means kind of like, like truthful, honest, protective. It's all, it's all in, that, in that root of the word. F a fiduciary duty, for instance, your accountant has a fiduciary duty to you, your uh, your investor in, in, investor, um, what do you call them? Like wealth management uh, individuals, they have a fiduciary duty to protect your funds. They can't just go spend thrifting, like Sam Bankman Fried, for example. He had a fiduciary duty to all his investors, right? He could not just start spending their money. Oops, I lost it. My bad. Mm, bye. You know that that doesn't work that way. Same with attorneys. We have a fiduciary duty to certain individuals like our clients, uh, the judges, uh, jurors, uh, to an extent, prosecutors. You know, we have a fiduciary duty. I did not have any fiduciary duty to Traveler's Lady in that courtroom. I did not have any fiduciary duty to Amber Heard. I did not have any fiduciary duty to even Johnny's team. I did not have a fiduciary duty to the court, Judge Escarati. I did not have a fiduciary duty to the bailiffs. I did not have a fiduciary duty to Amber's legal team at all. Why? Because I was not hired in the capacity of an attorney. Therefore, my attorney hat was off and my investigative journalist hat was on. So when I encounter information and I see with my own eyes certain bits of information, I don't owe anybody a fiduciary duty to protect that information lest I be, you know, sued or or uh, like a bar complaint for, filed against me because those will all be dismissed instantly. Why? Because I was not acting in the capacity of an attorney at the time of the dissemination of information and at the time of the collection of the information and the dissemination of the information. I was there in the capacity of a citizen slash investigative journalist. And some people kind of miss that mark. They don't quite understand how you can take hats on or off and I hope this kind of clarifies it for you because it's very important to understand in life when things can and cannot be done. Like you remember certain individuals who have, uh, let's just call it mocked my, my certain facial reactions and facial expressions in court. Again, it, none of these have anything to do with my capacity as an attorney. And that is the scariest part when you do not understand in what capacity you are acting, if you can't discern 
and, and that's and that's when when things go awry when you don't realize what you can and can't do if you're just like i'm always an attorney and i can't do anything well good for you you're not going to get anywhere in life that's the problem sometimes in life to to be able to accomplish things you have to take risks and you have to take calculated risks and if you're smart enough to understand where these risks are beneficial and are going to be uh, able to pay dividends, not only pay dividends, but are actually not as risky as you might think, such as taking the information I saw on the computer screen and disseminating it to my Twitter audience. Again, nothing ever came of that other than you all learning bits of information. Why? Because I knew that what I was doing was completely within the ethical uh, realm and the legal realm. And that is very important for especially um, for individuals who, like myself, who a lot of times we dabble in very sensitive things. And we find ourselves in very sensitive situations with very uh, uh, sensitive bits of information. And you have to determine sometimes in real time, and I'm talking seconds, uh, whether or not something is permissible or non-permissible. And it's not an easy game. It, it, it takes years of training, years of practice. You know, there's a reason they call it practicing law. And you, every day, well, you know what we're doing? Every single one of you, by the way, you know what you're doing? You are practicing life because you never master the art. That's the beauty of life. You never fully master the art of life. Because it's always a learning experience. There's always something to be gained. There's always something to be learned. You know how I know that? My grandmother, who is this close to turning 90, she's like a year and a few months, right? Not this year, but next year. 90. She's still, every day, I ask her, I'm like, Grandma, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I was reading an article learning about such and such. And I'm like, but why? You know, in my head, I never say it out loud. I'm very proud of her. I'm like, what? But in my head, I'm like, why are you? Because she never stops learning. There's always something new for her to know, something new for her to learn, some new cool video for her to watch, some cool article for her to read, some doctor's discovery that she wants to learn about and, and take a deep dive into. It's absolutely unbelievable. My grandmother, shout out, shout out Gam Gam. I swear to God, uh, visiting her, visiting her on New Year's was like the highlight of my year. I, I really underestimated how, how good it was going to be. She had like the biggest smile on her face. And she said, like, I, I had a feeling that you were going to come. Like, I don't even know how grandma, I mean, she said, I've been on this planet long enough. So she kind of felt it. But again, I, I don't know. It's been, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I love it. I love it. And uh, I, I wish that more people understood where the fine lines are, where the fine lines are drawn what is permissible and what is not permissible because that is going to solve a lot of drama. Ask Nick, by the way, I, I joined him in the hot tub stream last night. Uh, that was an experience. Uh, it was freezing cold. Shout out to you, Nick Riccada. Uh, But ask Nick, Nick knows Nick is very, very intelligent. Nick will tell you, he knows exactly where those lines are. Cause I've watched him. He knows what he can and what he cannot cross. Look at how he goes after YouTube. Look at how he goes after Rumble. He goes after locals. He goes after Twitter. He goes after his own bar association. He goes after these people who file complaints against him. Why is he like, it's like, oh my God, this dude is unafraid completely. Sure, there's an element of that in there too. But most critically, most critically, he knows exactly where that line in the sand is. He knows, uh, uh, I can't go here, but I can go here because here I'm still good. I'm still lawful, legal, ethical, etc. I can't cross over here because that's going to be a problem and that's going to land me in hot water. Because getting banned, anybody can get banned for anything. That's not, that's not crossing a line. That's getting attacked and doxxed and, and thrown, um, what's it called, uh, uh, mass flagging campaigns. That's what that is. That's not, he didn't cross any lines. He just fucked with the wrong people is what he did. And then they brought him back on every platform. So see, see what I mean? He, he knew in, in, deeply in his heart and mind that he was going to come back. 
eventually, however long it took. And he did. He was right. Why? Because he knows what lines to cross and what lines not to cross. And in this life, you have to know these things. Otherwise, you will land in deep hot water and you will be um, you will suffer. Uh, Joanna says, thanks for the early stream. For those of us across the pond, you're welcome. Uh, uh, I wish I could say I planned it just for you, but I didn't. Always a better experience to watch it live. Great stream and great company and chat. Pound it. Thank you. Thank you. And Larry brought the rain to LA. Objection, hearsay, objection, speculation, objection. Yeah, I probably did. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> Sorry. Um, tomorrow, more Amber Heard insurance stuff. Thank you all for joining me. I love every single one of you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Thank you, Claire Best. And I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody.